Good afternoon. I just wanted to mention, because so many folks were so interested in this past panel and will be interested in the one that we're about to have now, is that there is a breakout on platforms for investing in Africa that will be coming up this afternoon. So for those of you who have even more questions at the end of this panel that you want to have answered, that's an opportunity there. Um, I, I wanted to just say a couple things about Africa, just to tee things up. And I think, you know, we've, we've focused a lot today on on children that have gone hungry, uh, farmers, farming children that have gone hungry, the people who have gone without the education and opportunity they need, uh, and even the, the horrors of, of human trafficking. That's one part of the story. Um, I, I want to tell another. Um, first, Africa is a place for only, almost limitless innovation, almost limitless. And you know, you, obviously it's an old tale about M-Pesa and Ushahidi and others that we've talked about from Kenya. But these are innovations that were developed by Africans, for Africans, for the overall success of Africa and have spread around the world uh, because they work uh, and because they're deeply valuable and they meet felt needs. So that's point number one. Point number two is 27 out of 30 of Africa's largest economies are growing at a great, at a breakneck pace. Extraordinary expansion, expansion uh, extraordinary growth, enviable growth, uh, certainly from a US point of view. Look, some of that is driven by worldwide demand for commodities like timber and oil and, and minerals. But the vast majority of that growth is a function of choices made. It's conflicts that were ended, it's trade that's been liberalized, uh, it's, it's industries that have been privatized, uh, infrastructure investments, investments in education that have been made. Those are choices made. And that's a very important part of the African story. But my third point is that while we've had this extraordinary growth and this extraordinary success, poverty persists, right? Poverty persists because the growth is not as broad-based as every man and woman on this stage want it to be. And that's why they're here. And that's what they, why they do what they do, uh, and they're so deeply committed to philanthropy in, in all its forms. So I, I just wanted to make those points. I'm sorry for butting into your time, but I thought it'd be a good way to start us off. Um, I do want to start, James, with you. Uh, first place, James has been part of the Global Philanthropy Forum from, I think, the first year. I mean, certainly from early on and knows as well. But given the, 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 um, the panel that we just finished hearing about that was just so interesting, you've been very focused on making markets work for the poor. You know, from your perspective, this isn't just about growing economies. This is about expanding participation in those economies. Talk to us about why Equity Bank chose to be such an early adopter in the microfinance space. And that as you moved into both impact investing, but you know, investing in small and medium-sized enterprises, what you learned in that process? Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's true from the onset we focused on uh, what uh, people call the majority market. Uh, out of the realization that um, only 4% of the population in Kenya had been banked. So 96% of the population was excluded. And then we said, this is a structural market failure. Mm -hmm. Can we try and address that? And uh, to address that, then you had to deal with the sector that was excluded. But as uh, we became successful over a period of 20 years, we realized that people were progressively moving up the ladder and getting out um, and being able to progress uh, into other sectors. And so we decided to follow up and see what would happen. Eventually, we became an inclusive uh, financial service provider, not only providing uh, what you could call the limitants consumer segment, the agro uh, uh, segment, mm -hmm. the micro, the small, and the medium enterprises, but we went all up uh, the scale. But uh, the impact, as you likely said, has been best at uh, the SME sector, where so far, out of 8 million customers, we have about 30,000 uh, 
customers who have been able to graduate to that segment. But uh, although there are 30,000 in number out of 8.2 million, uh, they control 56% of the balance sheet, mm -hmm. suggesting the transformation of the potential. When you look at the number of, uh, on average, they employ about 12 uh, people. So again, you see about uh, 360,000 jobs mm -hmm. have been created by supporting that uh, segment um, of uh, investors. Mm -hmm. You know, as we learned yesterday from Paul in the, first, in the very first panel, uh, a lot of the growth ha has been driven by the ICT sector and the financial services sector, but 75% of the workforce is in agriculture, and you just touched on agriculture for a minute. Tell us something about the role that, that a bank like yours can play and others can play uh, in, in increasing livelihoods in, in that part of, of, of the economy. I think basically for the bulk of Africa, 85% of the population are living out of agriculture. But agriculture is in, it tra is in its traditional or dementally form. It's almost close to peasantly level. And where it uh, bridges up, it is what you could call scale, uh, small scale commercial farming, where you're just really producing a principal primary producer of cash crops. And essentially, you're at uh, the base of the value chain, uh, where there is no uniqueness, it's just mass production. And consequently, there is very little value. So essentially, as a bank, we thought the best uh, way of uh, doing intervention is one, to enhance productivity. And in Africa, the probability of increasing productivity up to the tune of 10 times by just simply uh, providing uh, the light chemicals, light fertilizers on time, uh, it's, it's easy. And simply by increasing productivity, essentially what you do is for the same cost, nearly same cost structure, particularly in labor, you're able to increase the incomes about four or five times. And that changes the livelihood and the quality of life. Uh, for the families. But um, as we get these class of uh, SMEs, we are now uh, interesting them in value addition in the agricultural sector, such that uh, we allow the farmers, either as cooperatives or societies or groups, to move up the value chain. They start processing. And as soon as they process, you find again, you increase uh, the value of the produce by another four or five times. And essentially, uh, that makes them um, agriculture um, a paying sector, a paying sector, and it ceases to be an occupation and it becomes more of a business. So we turn them into agribusiness as opposed to really peasantry farming. Mm -hmm. Now, you have combined uh, sort of leveraging markets and leveraging using private sector tools, banking tools, with more traditional philanthropy, with grant making, because you also lead your bank's foundation. Tell me what the, what the, what the focus is and, and what leads you to the choices you make. And is there a relationship between, a little bit about yesterday, the, the, this past panel, a relationship between what you're seeing as opportunity on the, the bank side, the sort of shared value side, and where you, where you believe only, only founda foundation grants can work? I think we realized that uh, by unlocking the value of the majority market, we are making it good for everybody, including ourselves. As we said, in agriculture, we have nearly uh, 200 uh, agroeconomists who do nothing else but go and help farmers in every village to create centers of excellence, such that it's practical learning, what we were talking of in the morning, that the farmers see it can be done and it's being done in their own villages and they copy using local language, using local communication. They learn from each other. And you see, essentially, a village fully transformed. But we transform one. So that is something we are doing. And essentially, when that happens, uh, the incomes of the farmers uh, changes. They become better customers to us. So essentially, it is literally doing good, uh, doing well, doing good to do well uh, as a bank. And it's the same when it comes to other sectors like uh, the SMEs, uh, together with the partners like uh, the MasterCard Foundation, uh, over the last uh, three years, we have targeted to train a million 
uh, people on financial literacy, taking them through a 13-week program. But essentially what we see is that uh, as they embrace budgeting, planning uh, in their businesses, they become more healthier, more stable businesses that are likely to, be, to succeed uh, over time. Uh, a majority of them increase their savings. So it's actually, social, it's really social impact has a return uh, eventually uh, for businesses uh, in enhancing the relationship. We see that that type of investment reduces the, uh, the risk of failure and consequently reduces the risk of borrowing. So that is the, there is a symbiotic relationship of investing in societies. Yeah. I'm going to actually talk a little bit about Tony Alumalu and, and doing well by doing good, but let me just, just stay with you for a moment because I know, James, that you're also a big believer in investing in leadership. Uh, you know, obviously, and, and not just, we're not just thinking about who will be political leaders, um, but who will be private sector leaders, who will be philanthropic leaders. Say something about the importance of that and how you go about it. Again, we realized uh, the gaps between the rich and the poor in societies is simply driven by opportunities. Who access opportunities? And we said the best way is to try and see whether uh, the um, majority market, at the bottom of the pyramid as we like calling it, whether we could create champions who could be able to pull uh, society's opportunities down to the bottom. And we, we analyzed and realized that there is a national selection method whereby uh, very gifted people uh, tend to be uh, best positioned to take opportunities in life. So we said, are there children who are very gifted but are never able to access opportunities because of financial need? And uh, we started by 12 years ago, sponsoring the best girl and the best boy in every uh, district and pushing them all the way to university education. And suddenly we realized that we were not only transforming individuals, we we're transforming f uh, families, transforming villages, and transforming societies. Because mm -hmm. one individual could pull the opportunities uh, by lobbying to the government, or once they get opportunities in employment, uh, they t pay school fees for the village. So. After realizing that, if that is possible, we had built up 1,300 such transformational leaders. We call them uh, uh, transformational leaders. Essentially, the first one ended up becoming our chief executive of a Equity Bank Rwanda on his 11th year of being in the program. Who knew this was a human resources strategy? So right? again, we realized that this, so three years ago, we decided we could also open opportunities for those other than in public universities. And today, three years later, we have uh, 91 kids in the US with Harvard having 14 of them. So you could imagine then when these well-trained Harvard graduates mm -hmm come back home or even get a job in the US, what will happen to their families, what will happen? I must say this attracted the attention of um, a lot of foundations. And MasterCard Foundation came and said, yeah, it appears to be a great idea, but you're only picking them when they're at Form 4. What about those who drop out, can't transit from primary education? So we went back to primary education, picked the top five percentile in the nation and asked, who among these ones can't make it to secondary school? Mm -hmm. And in the first year, we had 30,000, and we could only get 3,000. So today, we have 10,000 scholarships, all in the best schools in the country. And then you could imagine now with 10,000. We have now elicited support of people like USAID, uh, DFID, KFW. So we are hoping in the next uh, five years we'll be able to increase that number to 20,000 uh, kids. Mm -hmm. These are not really transformational leaders, but we are calling them social disruptors because these are people who really disrupt uh, uh, the social uh, structure of our society. Mm -hmm. We are hoping ultimately by 2030 the leadership of Kenya, whether in the private sector, the corporate or political leadership, will be shared between the haves 
and uh, the rest of the population that have not had opportunities in the mm -hmm. past. Because they are getting, accessing the best education that the children of uh, the most endowed in society. And when you talk of numbers of 20,000 children at the bottom of the pyramid, mm -hmm. accessing the best educa university education, they didn't have that opportunity, they couldn't have made it. One, you, one, you make them employable, Two, you make them uh, opinion shapers, so they are also able to pull and drag their villages and their communities and families as they move up uh, the ladder. So that is how we did it. And again, this is where we said we would devote 1% of uh, the turnover or the total revenue of the bank to do good to society. After doing it for many years, we realized we could seek partners, so we created a separate vehicle and uh, uh, a foundation, yeah. a corporate foundation, created, uh, give it uh, to an experienced uh, leader, Helen Geshohi is in the room, and what she did was that she said, I'll use the infrastructure of the bank free of charge, um, but I will also harness the ability of philanthropists to development institutions. And in three years, she has been able to raise together with our effort of $100 million to do good to society. Wow. James, we knew you were born to be a really good banker, right? But what was the personal experience that led you to be this kind of banker that put his energy, his efforts into making markets serve for the poor? A little bit of, uh, of it has to do with my experience of having come from a very humble background, being a beneficiary of a scholarship myself, mm. and seeing that uh, philanthropy prayed a uh, lot to make who me who I am. But also more my experience uh, in working environment. When I chose to, uh, to do this with Equity Bank, it was technically insolvent as a building society. And if it was not for social investment by Africa, a microfinance fund, that saw it, uh, saw the talent, that show, saw the commitment, and gave me $1.2 million in the year 2002, mm -hmm. I would not be here today. Mm -hmm. So if uh, Africa made it happen for me, I would like to make it happen for another generation of uh, uh, the youthful population. Mm -hmm. Now, Toyan Saraki is um, a, she's a successful barrister. Uh, she comes from a family and from a private enterprise. In private enterprise, she married into a family, uh, a political family. So she's had a, a experience with all these sort of different parts of society. But one of the most interesting things about Toyan Saraki is that she had an experience. Uh, oh, sorry for being personal about this, but had an experience that exposed you to uh, the kind of health services that the poor uh, get in uh, Nigeria as opposed to the privileged. Will you say something about that and how that might have influenced your philanthropy and the choices you've made? Well, to be honest, um, I didn't come through giving in the traditional way. I grew up in a typical Nigerian family where we give a lot, but our giving was not purpose driven. It was religiously driven. So once a year, you would do a tithe. My mother is a Christian, so she would give away 10% of whatever she felt like giving, usually our old clothes. And um, <laughs> my father, being a Muslim, gave away 10% of his income. But they just used to give through their mosques, their churches. And so long as whoever they were giving to was supposedly poor, they wouldn't really check to see what was happening to what they gave afterwards beyond the thank yous. So this was not structured giving. And um, we all felt good about it. You know, we gave and God was supposed to bless us. But um, when I was about 28 in 1991, I was pregnant and I was getting married and my country was preparing for the wedding of the year and so was I. <laughs> and um, then I, as you know, I was, um, hitching myself to a very strong political family. And we lived very calmly, royals, industrialists, but they didn't, and they were used to the way they lived. 
I think a week before the wedding, my father-in-law was running for president and had upset the government of the day. So he was picked up and locked up. And I was sitting in front of the television and I read about it. And that's when my life left the textbook and started delving into the footnotes. So my feet swelled, my brother rushed me to the hospital and they said bed rest and I still thought everything was going to be fine because I was educated, I was enlightened and I had a high expectation of what should happen. So it never occurred to me that anything would go wrong. Four or five days later, bed rest, trying to you know, calm me down and I'm saying I want to watch the news and this is one thing in my country actually. Information is at a premium. And quite often when you need information, that's when people think you should be kept away from that information. So the less information I had about what was happening politically, the more information I wanted and the more my blood pressure rose. Mm. The night before the wedding anyway, it was quite clear that there was no going back. And I was taken to the labor room. And that's when my brains kicked in. And I remembered all the books I'd read in my antenatal classes, so I started. It was a transactional process, actually. I realized very quickly that I couldn't just lie back and push. I had to negotiate, so I was asking, what about the epidural, what about the steroid injections, what about this and what about that? And every time I said, what about, they shook their heads and looked at each other, and then finally, my um, obstetrician, who happened to be in black silk pajamas, actually, I'll never forget, you know, because he'd been dragged out of his bed, finally looked at me and he said, my dear, you are in Nigeria and you're delivering in an emergency. I suggest you just push. So I pushed and I pushed and I pushed and one child came out very premature, but the second one got stuck. It is what doctors call a transverse lie. And then I realized everything that was wrong with the medical systems in my country. And I was in one of the best hospitals. But actually, you know, delivery is not something that your social status changes. You know, delivering a baby is universal. <laughs> you know, ever since the days of Adam and Eve, it hasn't changed. You either push it out or they cut it out. And there was this life-changing delay. They didn't have a scanner in the labor room. They didn't have an anesthetist handy. So I had to then, you know, after all the push, 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 it became, no, 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 don't push. And of course, my womb was contracting on itself. So I had to hold on and remember all my yoga and my breathing and God and whatever, and hold on for 45 minutes while they could bring in an anesthetist. And then, of course, there was no epidural, so they put me to sleep. And I remember the last thing before I was put to sleep, I started praying. I was reading Psalm 23 to myself, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, because I knew that the situation was critical. I woke up the next day and again, my question started. Okay, take me to my babies. They took me, they put me in a wheelchair and took me to the intensive care baby unit and I only saw one child. So I said, but I was having twins, you know, where's the second one? And that was where the lies began, because they also knew that, you know, the people to conduct my wedding were arriving in the hospital. And to them, it was more important that I was presented, you know, to my parents the way I should have been. So they said, oh, the baby's in this other hospital. And, you know, they were telling me different lies. So I composed myself and I went through the wedding. And then everybody went to the reception. And then I asked to be taken back again. And, you know, I had put my two and two together, so I knew that there was every chance that the other child had made it. But I didn't actually have time to feel sorry for myself or cry, because I was in a country where my 28-week surviving twin, who was 1.2 kilos, was in an incubator. You know, on paper, if we had a checklist, everything looked right. There was a neonatologist. The child was in an incubator. But this is also a country where electricity failure goes every 10 minutes. And this was a child on life support. So I knew I couldn't rely on the machines. So I, you know, I flung myself into it. And I started sitting in the special care baby unit 24 seven. And if I needed to go home, I would call one of my brothers or my mother and they would come and sit. And over the next few weeks, I learned everything there was to learn about medicine and the care of newborns, the difference between premature children and regular children and the failures in our infrastructure and 
the, the joys of our health workers when they're devoted, but the fact that they don't have the equipment they need. And most importantly, the lack of accountability. It didn't occur to anybody at any point to provide an explanation for what had happened to me or the fact that they couldn't save the second child. They didn't even feel that they owed me the dignity of asking me what my children should be called. When I was leaving the hospital, they gave me two envelopes. And one envelope was my surviving daughter's birth certificate. And it said, baby Saraki one. And the second envelope was my dead daughter's death certificate. And that said, baby Ojora two. So I picked them up and I said to the doctor, how did you decide which one was the Saraki and which one was the Ojora? And they just shook their heads. And I became very fired up with the sense of injustice. Meaning the lack her, hus of her husband's name and her maiden name. Yeah, so they basically gave me the dead one and they gave my husband the live one. And um, initially I thought it was just me. I thought I was just unlucky. But I had been making all sorts of promises to God that if you just let this child survive, you know, I will help people, I, whatever. And it was strange because two nights after I had my baby, somebody had a baby in the area of the hospital, and even though this is one of the best hospitals, it's actually in a very poor area. And strangely enough, my father's head offices are in the building next door because he always wanted to stay close to the people. And they brought in this child, like wrapped in rags, you know, with the umbilical cord still attached. And the hospital were telling them, you know, we will help you and we'll clean up this child, but you people, you can't afford, you know, why did you have the child at home in the first place? And you can't afford treatment here and you're going to have to take the baby away. And I just thought, well, hey, I'm here. I have two of everything and I only need one of everything now. So I said, let the child come, you know. That was the beginning of keeping my promise. Let this child come and put this child in the incubator next to my own. And don't worry about the bill. If it's something that money can do, don't let them worry about the money, I will do it. And so for years after, I actually thought it was something money could do. So I was, you know, donating incubators. If I heard somebody was somewhere, couldn't pay a hospital bill, I would race there, I would pay the bill. And I felt good about it. Until about 12 years later, my husband ran for public office and he won. He became a governor. And his father is a philanthropist of note. In fact, is legendary in his lifetime. It was not unusual for us to host 18,000 people for dinner on a Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have um, a building behind our house, our country house, which we call Ilea Rubo, and it means the house of the old. And all the old women in the environs, they would just come. Some would come by car, some would walk, but they know that if they came, they would get a meal they would get clothing, and they would get a little bit of money, enough to take them home and cook the next meal. It was just yesterday, actually, I realized that what he was doing was giving them dignity. Because, of course, it doesn't make us popular with our neighbors. You know, we live in quite an elite area. And then you have all these hordes and hordes of women, you know, coming. And in fact, it, it got very out of hand. We even had um, musical bands that would play the music to keep them occupied until he could so, eat There's them. Nothing, nothing that upsets your neighbors more than a party for 18,000, <laughs> right? <laughs> but when we got to his state, you know, the one thing that they always ask you to do as a governor's wife, actually it's all derivative and they don't really expect you to be very serious, but they call you when people have babies so that you can congratulate them. They call you when people die. It's a finely tuned protocol. It's called condolence visits, you know, and I have entire wardrobes of black and white just to go on condolence visits. And then they call you when people are getting married because you always officiate over the cake cutting. But um, after about a month, I realized that there was a disproportion. I was making so many condolence visits that it didn't make sense. And it was mostly women in childbirth. And what used to upset me was not even so much that the women had died, it was the shrug of the shoulders and the acceptance. So, you know, she died in childbirth. Okay, shrug shoulders. 40 days mourning, day 42, her family will bring another of their daughters for the man to marry so that somebody can look after the child. 
And I became filled with what I can only describe as outrage because I realized that it wasn't that I was unlucky all those years ago. I realized we had a national emergency. And I was trying to get numbers, data, statistics, and nobody wanted to count. You know, they just wanted to bury the women quietly and move on. So um, I decided to take it up again. And this time, I didn't take it up from the point of giving money. I wanted to take it up from the point of data, facts. Where are the gaps in the system? Why are people dying? Who is going to be held accountable for this? And in the meantime, I had had more children. And all my pregnancies actually were complicated. So, you know, I realized, okay, you do have a problem. But what changed was the way the system was dealing with my problem. In my next pregnancy, nobody told me. On the dot of six weeks, I ran to London. And it's a terrible thing. Actually, in Nigerian public life, the biggest insults they always throw at public officials is, oh, don't mind them. They don't know what our hospitals are like. They all go to London to have their babies. But anyway, I admit it. Guilty as charged. I ran to London at the sixth week of pregnancy, and I did not move until after I had had my children. But in my second pregnancy, I ran into a problem again. Again, preeclampsia again, postpartum hemorrhage, again, the negotiation. This time, I wasn't negotiating to have the babies. I was negotiating as to whether they were going to move me with the child inside me or whether they were going to let me have and then start moving the child to where the intensive care is. But I realized that that was an informed negotiating process. Mm -hmm. It was, okay, you're 31 weeks, we can deliver you. But where we have the intensive care is in another hospital. Do you want to deliver here and we move the baby? Or do you want the baby moved inside you and then you go deliver there? And you know, I negotiated everything and all was well. The, the baby had the cord around the neck, but the scanner knew that the cord was around the neck so the midwife was ready to turn the baby. And you know, it was all about information being available where you need it. And then when I was leaving hospital, they handed me this red book. And I said, what's that? And they said, oh, that is your child's health record. And I opened this book, and every single thing from the point that child came out was to be documented in this book. So I had such a sense of empowerment because I knew what the British government, which is where I had my baby, owed a baby. You know, if you call it the statistical value of life or the actions that define the statistical value of life, I knew what the government owed that child. So I could look at my child and know how to reach out for it. And my brain started ticking. And I thought, okay, what does my government owe a pregnant woman? What does my government owe every child? And I discovered that nobody knew what my government actually owed. It all seemed to be very discretionary. And we had no sense of entitlement. A sense of entitlement is a bad thing in a command economy. But where I come from, there was no sense of entitlement. It was purely discretion. If you got something good, you knelt and you said thank you. If you didn't get it, you just kept it to yourself and you suffered in silence. So I decided to write that book for Nigeria to empower our pregnant women and their children under five. It was a four-year process and a $2 million investment. First of all, I went to the people who wrote the British one and I said, I want this you know, for my people. And they said, well, it's not quite so simple as placing an order because we don't know what services your government provides. So I ran back home and I went to the Federal Ministry of Health and I said, right now, tell me, what service do you provide and how is it supposed to be delivered? And you know, we went through a series of consultations. I must have spoken to over 400 medical professionals in Nigeria, hosted workshops, and then I wrote the book and my government adopted it for use within the midwife's service scheme. And I left it for them, I said, because for them to make it work, it really has to be theirs. And I then began to concentrate on informing women so that they know, you know, we need to raise expectations. I believe that the unmet need will be in behavioral change, demand creation. I don't think we can get the good results if we don't expect to get the good results. So I'm trying to raise the bar. So let me take you a little further on that because this is something we've talked about before is this concept of demand creation that you have. And it's basically, um, it's basically understanding 
that you are of value and that Absolutely. you should expect dignity and you should expect basic services when it comes to comes to health. But it goes beyond. Your philanthropy is now not only focused on women's on maternal health, uh, but it's focused on women's education. Yeah. It's focused on uh, on women's empowerment more generally. And from what I can tell, I have to say, you leave no stone unturned. You're willing to use everything at your disposal. And let me just say, call out an example and, um, and see if I can talk you into saying a word about this. It seems to me that you're quite willing to shine the Klieg light on, you know, shine the spotlight um, and keep get the cameras rolling in order to affect the behaviors of others. So maybe you'd say a little bit about uh, in your efforts to promote vaccination um, and your efforts to, to engage local, traditional, and religious leaders, uh, how you combine this kind of partnership with also a sense of a, a bit of a communications plan. Well, it's funny, you know, we all know that immunization is the central pillar to child health. When I was young, there used to be this advert they used to play on TV, and it had a drum beat, and it used to say, da 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 Prevention is better than cure. And it was something that resonated, you know, it's better to prevent things than to be trying to cure them. And when my husband was governor, we had a polio problem in Nigeria. The rumor had spread that the West was using the oral polio vaccine to reduce population. This is, I'm not talking about informed choice, I'm talking about what people felt would be mass sterilization. Meanwhile, polio is a terrible, terrible disease. You know, if, if you've come into contact with it, you see that it's not just at the point of contact you suffer, they suffer forever. And um, as the state first lady, I was expected to lead the polio immunization campaign, which actually usually meant, you know, I'm taken to a field and I smile and I take pictures and they give me a couple of bouncing babies and I put the oral polio in, under their tongue and, you know, that's the end of that. And I thought to myself, my husband's state, uh, where he comes from and where he used to lead, it's situated where the north meets the west, so to speak also where Christianity meets Islam. And their logo used to be the state of harmony because it's where everybody lives together without fighting. And I thought to myself, how can we deal with this um, issue of people not wanting to bring their children out? So I reached out to the emir because I remembered that his young wife had just had twins. He had married a young princess from Bornu who had twin boys actually. And I said, would you mind if I come and visit you? I would like you to bless this polio campaign. And he said, oh yes, of course, you know, I'll be happy, you know, when do you want to come? And I said, oh, Friday at 12 o'clock. And I picked the time very strategically because it's just before everybody was going to be heading to the mosque and there's a very big mosque next to the Emir's palace. So I went along, you know, with the nurses and the doses of the vaccine and he received me, I greeted him, handed over the traditional gifts and I said, oh, you know, I brought out the vaccine, I said, please bless it. And of course I had all the TV cameras with me. So he blessed it. And I said, oh, well, you know, since I'm here, what about the babies? And he said, which babies? And I said, your twins. I said, have they received their oral polio vaccine? <laughs> and um, he said, well, no. And I said, well, this is as good a time as any. You know, please, uh, <laughs> please bring the twins and let us give them their oral polio vaccine. So I handed him one baby. You know, they brought the baby. It's probably the first time he'd even carried his own baby. But, uh, <laughs> because, you know, we women do these things in uh, Nigeria. So I gave him one of his twins and I carried the second twin and with the cameras ringing and the drummers drumming. And, we immunized them and then we stayed, we talked. By the time we came out of the palace, there were about 8,000 people with babies just waiting outside the palace because they felt if the emir could immunize his own, you know, newborn twins with this oral polio vaccine, who were they not to? And this showed me the importance of picking champions that exist within communities. You know, people are convinced more easily by the practices of their own people than by something foreign being foisted on them. And it's served us well. <laughs> I thought this was important to call out for two reasons. One, the importance, I mean, Toyin Saraki um, 
partners both internationally, globally, with the UN and others, um, but also the importance of partnering, to realizing that your partners are local leaders as well. But the second reason I wanted to call it out is back to what Sandhil was telling us at the very beginning of the conference about understanding the behaviors of others. Um, this is not the only place where the polio effort has been harmed, right? Uh, in, in Pakistan, uh, because the US government used a health worker to gain access to bin Laden's compound, now there is no willingness to let a health worker in, you know, to trust that a health worker is a health worker. So we have to think about the consequences uh, and ways to overcome, just as brilliantly as you have. Atsitsi Masiwa, I want to turn to you for, for just a moment. Um, you and your, and your husband Strive are from Zimbabwe. Uh, he was a very successful businessman. He, um, uh, you, I, I know more about you than you think because my best friend in San Francisco was raised with you and went to school with you <laughs> <laughs> in Zimbabwe. It's funny that we share this friendship. Um, but you ran into a, a big snag when your husband applied for the license. You, you wanted the privatization, I guess, of the, of the telecom industry and to get the license. Say something about that and how that has affected your philanthropy, okay, that sure. experience. Thank you, Jane. Um, I was really fascinated by your story and it really resonated with some of the experiences that we had. Uh, one morning my husband woke up and decided um, he had come across several months before a new technology uh, for mobile uh, telephone and he wanted to he applied for a license so that he could set up a business in, um, in, the, you know, in telecommunications. And he thought it was a straightforward, you tell the government there's a new technology, everybody's going to benefit and others are doing it, so let's get in it very quickly. And the response was no. There wasn't information on what the cell phones are about, the impact of the technology on just communications, on um, freedom on uh, just the whole impact on society. And anyway, um, so the government said no because they felt governments have monopolies over telecommunications. Anyway, uh, so after they said no, he went back and decided to sue the government. Now just to, to <laughs> hold on this for a moment. Strive Masio is, is known for being a brilliant guy. He's suing the Mugabe government. It's the only thing that gives me pause. Here. Go ahead. Oh, well, you know, you, you assume that there is a separation. It wasn't personal. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he did, and, uh, and that we really irritated the government. It was something that is... <laughs> That is not done. But you know, I can look back, reflect, and smile about it. But for me, I, I shared snippets of it earlier. It was a really, really terrible experience that I wouldn't want to live again. But I see what came out of it, because we lost everything. We, we were in business before, but uh, our biggest uh, customer was the government. So you bite the hand that feeds you. Guess what happens? They just closed every contract and uh, we had nothing left. We didn't even have the legal fees to pay the lawyers. But because we had such a cause that everybody really believed in and they, they felt that there was, what we were trying to do was a genuine uh, recognition of a genuine opportunity in a new industry in that our intentions were pure. But so we had a lot of support from uh, people, but I think the embarrassment was how do you take the government to court? So we were in and out of court many times, and uh, I can write a book on what happened. Mm -hmm. But eventually, um, I recall it was uh, the 31st of December, 1997, and I was seven months pregnant, and we got a call that please, uh, it was on the 30th, it was please be in court in the morning, 10 o'clock. So we knew we had lost everything. We had been through hell and back. So there wasn't anything that they could tell us that would make anything worse. But we never lost sight of the fact that we knew what we were doing was right. We had a cause ending that, that the impact of what we were going to do would 
transcend beyond personal benefit, that it would be, be something that would benefit the nation, that would really take us to, uh, you know, to help create, a, you know, build a platform for a new way of, of life, a new way of thinking, a, a new way of, of expressing liberty among, you know, the, the population. So anyway, we went to court and we issued the license by the High Court. So that's how we celebrated our new year. <laughs> uh, but through all that, uh, as I said earlier, you begin to question yourself, why am I going through all this? What makes, made it worth it? What made it, what gave me hope every single day to wake up the next morning and say, it's worth living another day? that we didn't leave the country, we had nowhere to go anyway. So, you know, what gave us the guts and the courage to stay where you're not wanted? You feel like you're a visitor in your own country. But it's because we knew we had a deep conviction that what we're doing was the right thing. And when I look back, one of the commitments we made, and we made this independent of one another. I said, Lord, if you, I get that license, I will look after the orphans. I, it doesn't matter how big, how small, what the uh, challenges are. I'll live my life to give a better uh, way of life for the disadvantaged, especially orphans. And you know, that's what I did. The minute the license came, I left my job and that's what I've done ever since. But we've expand, expanded the work because you know, with philanthropy, you see a need mm -hmm. and you want to answer a need. So it started with the orphans. And then we saw, you know, uh, James's model. I think we shared something, you know, uh, very similar. It's amazing, your model is very similar to ours, but yours is better than ours, so we have a lot to learn from that. <laughs> but it was, what do we do with all these very clever, intelligent young men and women who, if given an opportunity, can go to the best institutions and come back and be the future presidents, mm -hmm. permanent secretaries, entrepreneurs, leaders uh, in NGOs, in companies, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, opportunities available for them. So we then set up a scholarship fund for them. And then there was the health crisis. Uh, I honestly turn green with envy when you talk about uh, the opportunities in your countries, how you have the liberty to do something. Uh, I mean, when I say I'm a Zimbabwean, I think uh, people don't know where to look sometimes. <laughs> Everybody harasses you for being a Zimbabwean, from the airport to, to wherever, to the immigration office, because of such of the, you know, the separation and the isolation. Uh, so you always have to do your work in an environment whereby you're saying, I may not have the right partners to do the work that I do with now, but we are creating the you know, the environment that when things turn, the partners will come and they will be able to hasten the work, you know, to be, you know, to do it even quicker because we'll be able to build on the success that uh, Equity Bank has built, uh, what Toyin has done and uh, what um, Tony's foundation has done. Now, I should say there also was, a, when I first met you last year, you and Strive last year, and you were telling me this story, um, he had just come from negotiating with Morehouse College and Spelman College, mm -hmm. and, and I know your first boy, Moses, was at Harvard, wasn't he? Uh, no, 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 not Moses. There wasn't Moses, oh well. Yeah. They are all my first bonds, by the way. <laughs> but, um, so he was, he was thinking through how to ensure that those, those children who passed their exams, who did well enough, who qualified on the merits, would have a, a, a world-class university to go to. Mm. So that's been part of it. It's been building partnerships as well. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, the question you ask yourself is, do we just focus on the f giving scholarships to rural children in very small, uh, where the school fees, uh, the amount is very small, but there are no resources, there are no teachers, there are no books, no electricity, or do you, you know, bite the bullet and decide, okay, the investment should be at all levels. Mm -hmm. We'll do it for the rural areas, we'll do it for the urban areas, we'll do it for the local universities. And where we can find partnership with good uh, universities, for example, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, the partnership with, is with Morehouse. We uh, pay for the uh, students mm -hmm. and uh, 10 young men this uh, last year and 10 goals this year, and mm -hmm. our goal is to go up to 40 uh, students. 
Um, so you look, look at the cost, but the benefit, the return, there were issues of impact that uh, we discussed earlier. The return is not financial, but the return is the change, the positive change we see in Africa has begun, it's real. And part of our role as philanthropists is to, uh, to fill in the gap that where government cannot have that vision and have, or if they've got the resources, they don't have the guts to release that money, invest it in a, giving the young people skills to go to these institutions and then come back and invest back you know, their expertise and their knowledge and what have you to make sure that we are part of the growth process mm -hmm. uh, of the African economies. And what's interesting to me, you, you referred to, uh, to having some opportunities in, in Nigeria. It seems to me that I'm sitting here with a panel of people who create opportunities. And that that's, that that's what it's about, regardless of environment, mm. and create opportunities. There's a determination here. Wibe, Wibe is, is the um, executive director of Tony Alumali's uh, foundation, which is really a unique, um, a unique foundation in terms of its approach. It's, it, um, and, and, and many of you were here last year when, when, uh, when he spoke. He gave a keynote uh, address. Um, I think the key here is to sort of understand, well, let me see if I can summarize this up a bit because there's so much, um, is, is, that, is that he very much in the same, same approach as Equity Bank, he took a failing commercial bank uh, in Nigeria, he turned it around by choosing to, to bank the unbanked by being a, a banker to the poor, in essence, and it turned it into a pan-African a pan powerhouse. So that sort of uh, issue one is kind of the shared value approach. Issue two is he also has a holding company. He does investing, not only impact investing, but small and medium enterprise investing, very much the kind of job-creating opportunities. Uh, Number three, you, you do normal foundation work, the sort of, the sort of uh, grant making work. Um, four, I'd argue he's not shy about using his voice when it comes to policy, uh, very much like your neighbor, Vajna mm -hmm. <laughs> Toyan, has a willingness to, um, to use her voice that way. But I think the most interesting thing I just experienced by just spending a week with, with you in Nigeria is is, the, is a boosterism I deeply admire. And I wanted to call attention to this because what he's done is he has honored and calls dramatic, pretty dramatic public attention to the 50 fastest growing companies in Nigeria. And that tells the world that Nigeria is a good investment. Mm -hmm. That alone, that a man who's known to be a smart investor demonstrates that kind of extraordinary growth um, so tell us something about this sort of philosophy that is such an integrated approach to trying to achieve social change. It's a model I haven't seen elsewhere. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just before I start, I'd like to say that um, Mrs. Soraki is actually very good at shining the Klieg light on people, and I'm often a victim of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be sitting next to you. It's nice to be on your side this time. Um, so... Um, I don't know how many of you were here last year when Mr. Lumulu was here, and um, you know he's back in Nigeria making money so that I can give it away or invest it. Um, so you know his journey was that you know he he like you said took over a, a failing bank. Basically, they they raised about five million dollars, took over this bank through a series of um, you know investments and additional growth, and then also like you said going down market, not as far down market as Equity Bank, but in Nigeria at that time, you know, only like 5% of the population was banked. So they democratized banking, took bank branches across uh, parts of the country that hadn't had branches before, um, and then also used technology to link them all together uh, in, in, in a way that hadn't been done before. And they very quickly turned it into the fifth largest bank, eventually took over one of the old traditional banks, the United Bank for Africa, merged them, and then took that across Africa. And so when he retired in 2010 at the uh, ripe old age of 47, um, he started a foundation and the investment company, and both kind of were embedded with the DNA that he had used to build that company. And what he charged us with in the foundation was two things. One was to create another thousand UBAs, and that was the idea of, look, we took a $5 million investment and turned it into a, you know, a bank with a market cap of two and a half, three billion dollars $14 billion under assets, 20,000 employees operating in 20 African countries. If you could create another thousand banks like that, um, in, you know, empower, promote, help, support a thousand African entrepreneurs to build those kinds of businesses. Think about what that could do to the economy. Um, so that was the first charge. The second charge was what he called institutionalizing luck. 
And you know, he looks at it that you know, in 1997, he was at the right place at the right time. They got this bank. They had some people who believed in them. He had some mentors. There were some policy initiatives that were put in place along the way that every time it was like he was on the right side at the right place at the right time. And you know, he feels like most entrepreneurs don't get that. And so you know, the millions of others who tried to start businesses like he did didn't succeed and didn't quite get as successful as him. And so the idea is with institutionalizing luck is what can we do to create an enabling environment that any entrepreneur has an equal opportunity to get there. Um, and that's one where we now kind of focus on the entire environment and not just the sort of target of 1,000 uh, entrepreneurs. Um, so that's really you know, what our focus is in philanthropy. On the commercial side, it's actually somewhat similar where he um, deploys capital to businesses that um, not, not just create economic wealth, but also social wealth. So he's investing in a, in a different way. I mean, some of this sounds relatively obvious, but in the Nigerian economy where you can make money pretty easily on very you know, short-term thinking, um, his approach is quite different. So for example, uh, he has a number of, uh, of oil blocks um, and that, that he's, he's purchased over the last years, and, and they're in the process of developing them. The traditional model in Nigeria has been you take the oil and gas to the closest coast and get it out of Nigeria. Um, for whatever price you can get, and then you import back the refined petroleum and sort of, you know, you don't create jobs, you're not creating any value, and you're actually wasting a lot of money. Um, and instead, he's going to use the gas, first of all, to, um, to, to, uh, as the um, main ingredient for fertilizer, which again will now have another knock on of social value, but it will also create jobs in the factory, but then also, of course, have an impact on agricultural production. Um, and then the second part is they'll use the gas to power um, the, the, the um, the power plant that they've now uh, won in, in one of the um, privatization bids. And so again- the Actual refining takes place in- Well, or, it won't be refined not, because be refined, yeah. you're using the gas directly for, for these. So again, it, you know, it's again this idea that, okay, I could very easily just take the gas out and sell it and, and be done with it and get my money. But this way it's, it's actually creating a couple of additional steps, which is a lot more complicated, takes a lot more capital, takes a lot more time. But ultimately you'll actually create a lot more local jobs and have a lot more local value. Um, so sort of, in some ways, I, when I, I heard, um, you know, sort of the, the description of Omidyar, it's similar in that, um, you know, we, we, we kind of use whatever tool you need to use to have economic and social impact, whether it's the commercial large-scale investments or if it's, you know, a grant to create, you know, the right sort of infrastructure for incubating uh, startup businesses or an investment in a social enterprise or a phone call to the president um, or, you know, convening a number of people to kind of get, get a movement going, you know, whatever it takes to make that social impact, we'll, we'll do it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that, that happens to be true of everyone on this stage, I think we can say, is there's this sort of understanding of social change as being about voice as well as being about resources as well as being about uh, investment resources. Um, tell us about uh, uh, the foray into the agricultural sector, the Mtange farms, because that's a good hybrid uh, example. So tell us about right. his work with it, regard to that. So. Um, Early on uh, in the foundation, well, we, we, the foundation and the, the um, Ayers Holdings, the investment company, were founded at the same time. Um, and you know, early on, you know, we talked about as a foundation, we were going to kind of do things differently. We were going to do this thing called impact investing, which in Nigeria, no one had really heard of. Um, and so because no one had heard of it, there also meant there weren't really any deals to do. And so we wanted to do something relatively early. And so we, there was this deal that was presented to us for a, a productive farm in Tanzania. And we thought, okay, look, it's not in Nigeria, but it's in agriculture, it's you know, elsewhere in Africa, and it's actually something that if we made that investment, um, you know, even beyond the social impact that the investment would have, um, just the story of a Nigerian investing in a farm in Tanzania that's you know, creating social and economic wealth would itself sort of shine the light on a different kind of investing and actually attract you know, additional um, investments in Nigeria and elsewhere into that space from, from domestic investors. And so, uh, you know, that investment, you know, it wasn't a huge a lot of, of funds, but basically it was in a 3,000 acre farm. Um, and and the, the funds we put in basically helped to, um, you know, get the grain business going. And so it's producing uh, wheat and maize for the domestic market. But then also um, there's a whole business of seed potatoes, where something that would traditionally have been done as a development project, a grant funded development project, was actually done as a, as a business where um, we went through the process with the government of registering new varieties of seed potatoes the first new varieties that had been introduced to Tanzania in 30 years. And so uh, I believe they're now in the third generation and I think the next generation they can now be put into the market. Um, but just by introducing those new varieties, the 150,000 smallholder potato farms in southern Tanzania, once they have access to those, um, 
without adding any irrigation, any fertilizer, et cetera, just the new seed potatoes, they'll get three to four times the yield. And obviously that has huge impact on incomes, nutrition, food security. Um, so, you know, all of those things together, I think, made it a very interesting and attractive investment. But the model we had was, it wasn't just the foundation that invested in it because it had a, obviously a positive social impact, um, but the financial returns were also attractive. So we also cr brought in money from the, the commercial side. What are some of the key influencers in Tony Alumalu's life that brought him to this place, in your view? Um, well, that's actually easy to answer because um, in our office building in Lagos, we have four meeting rooms. And each of the meeting rooms is named after someone that had a significant role in, in sort of his own personal and career development. So um, our board room is the Suzanne room, which is after his mother. So uh, clearly she had a significant impact on his life. And last year, actually, she was kidnapped mm -hmm. and held for ransom. And um, he uh, dedicated the same sort of laser focus he does to everything, and he got her free. And I wouldn't want to be the guys who tried that. <laughs> um, the second room, our lecture theater, is the Dominic room, which is named after his father. Um, and then the, the, the sort of main meeting room that we use downstairs uh, is called the Benigo room, which is named after Chief Benigo, who was his first mentor. And he was the man that, at, when, when Mr. Lumulu was only 26, made him a branch manager, which was unheard of in the banking sector in Nigeria at the time. And so he really sees it as Chief Benigo as being the man who set him on his path. And so when he does mentoring and when he talks to young entrepreneurs, it's always with the spirit of Chief Benigo behind him. Um, and then the third one is the Taj Room. I actually can't remember what the name of the person is, but that's their initials, and that was his first boss. Mm. Um, so those are you know, the people that had a significant impact. Um, and I'd like to say that on his model of philanthropy, I had a little bit of that impact. Um, but of course, I was uh, following in the footsteps of Dr. Rodin. And in fact, um, I was charged, or the Africa office was charged in Rockefeller by Dr. Rodin in early 2010 to go and identify African philanthropists around the continent that the, the foundation could work with. And um, I stumbled across Tony Alumulu. There was an ad for the CEO of this foundation. And I thought, hey, great, let me meet them and talk to them about 21st century catalytic philanthropy and impact investing um, you know, as, a, as a response to what Dr. Rodin asked us to do. And so I ended up meeting with him, with Mr. Alumulu in, in New York. Um, had a fantastic conversation about sort of new models of philanthropy and then left and then got a call and he said, why don't you just come and do it? And I said, no. Um, and then I said, no again and then again. And then finally, he's very persuasive like uh, Mrs. Soraki. And um, I decided to, you know, you know drop, you know, we were, I was working with Rockefeller Foundation in Nairobi. That's a pretty, you know, it's been around for 100 years. You have a pretty solid, you know, future there. Um, and I, I gave that up to move back to Nigeria where I was born um, because I felt like we could actually work with him to sort of almost invent a new kind of philanthropy in Africa. Um, and also there were no uh, you know, handcuffs that the IRS puts on you as an American philanthropy. And so again, that was one of the reasons why we could kind of be very free with our model and, and the tools that we had to use. Let me get back to the mentorship, but let me just say for a moment that, that, uh, that Weber was, was born in Nigeria. His parents are missionaries. They're Canadian, aren't they, your parents? Dutch, Canadian, American. Dutch, Canadian. And they're just there. All, and they're here. So thank you for joining us. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I do want to go back, though. Uh, I'll go back to mentorship in a moment, but I do want to go back to the kidnapping. Um, last year, the finance minister's mother was kidnapped as well, and Gozi Akanjo Awela, many of you know, she's on our advisory board. Um, when you are trying to do your all to ensure the success of a country, and yet what is in the headlines mm -hmm. is crime and, and mm -hmm. corruption, mm -hmm. what role can leaders like Tony Lumalu, like every one of you, what can be done mm -hmm. to deal with that? A very significant barrier. Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you a, a great example of this. About um, six weeks ago, um, the Nigerian president signed over the 16 or so companies that had been um, created out of the, the breakup of the national power monopoly to the, people who, to the companies that won them and paid for them in the privatization process. And that was basically in one, in one hour was the largest single act in, to transform the power sector in Africa, possibly the world. Um, and the headline the next day about Nigeria was that uh, seven or eight French tourists had been kidnapped in northern Cameroon and driven into Nigeria on motorcycles by Boko Haram. 
And so that's, I think, a tell, tell, um, you know, really telling of exactly what you're saying, that the, the, the wrong, I mean, yes, there are those things happening, but the story of transformation that's really going on is not being properly told. Mm. And so the image people have of Africa is still a very sort of outdated one. And, you know, when you look at Nigeria, it's one of the world's top five fastest growing economies. Mm. Mm. Um, within five to 10 years, it should be one of the BRICs that will be called the Brinks. Mm. Um, you know, and the work we did with identifying the 50 fastest growing companies in Nigeria, these companies, these are unlisted companies, they grew at an average rate of 100% a year for the past three years, 50 companies. Um, that doesn't sound like a country that's in you know, chaos and, to, mm. and so on. And so I think that's a story that we're trying to tell. And in some ways, it's that communication of that different side of Nigeria that I think really changes the way investors and others look at the continent. You're looking knowing. Would you like to add a point there? No, I was just, um, when you were speaking about our tremendous growth that is there, but I also work very close to the front line. And we have um, some very grinding poverty in Nigeria that makes it as if they're two completely different worlds. And I'm always very worried as to what will happen if these two worlds actually collide. Mm. I remember the kidnap incident. I remember the killing of the health workers. Even just last week, two of my friends had their sons kidnapped. And one of them is actually, I think, the biggest brewer in Nigeria. You know, they make seven up in Nigeria. And I am convinced that the only way to stop the levels of resentment that bring what is essentially crime you know, kidnapping, irrespective of whatever um, ideology the, the kidnappers think they have that justifies their actions. I think education is actually going to be our only way out. You know, again, I'm going back to behavioral change and demand creation, but the fact of the matter, and I remember that kidnapping, you know, they kidnap somebody and, you know, they're not living somewhere in a vacuum. They're taking them somewhere to some community. Some of the other members of the community must know that there's a kidnap victim there. The telcos have been very good about helping us track, you know, when kidnappers have seized someone. Even I have been um, almost a victim. You know, there was a plot at a point to kidnap my children and I was very lucky I got a warning from the kidnappers couldn't agree actually between themselves, so one of them sent me a warning with a ransom note. And the telcos saved me, actually, because you know, I immediately sent out the numbers and they did the tracing and they let me know exactly where and where and where the location was. And one of the kidnappers was actually working in my house. But um, I just wonder whether we all shouldn't be looking more closely at education again. Because if we do not raise the educational standards to raise the bar of, again, what is expected, we are all at the mercy of people who feel that they're not getting what they should or do not even fully understand. Um, just as an example, I was talking to one of my social media chaps and we were talking about the difference between the life. One of his friends lived in Dubai and this chap when he visited Nigeria. And he told me with absolute incredulity that, oh, do I know his friend pays electricity bills in Dubai? And I was like, but we all pay electricity bills. And that's when I realized that there is a subsection of people in the country who have never seen an electricity bill, mm. let alone paid one. And so this is where I begin to think the African philanthropies. When we're getting together, we're moving into more structured giving. We're helping governments, and in helping governments, we're helping ourselves. Because what is the point of all this wealth if you cannot lay your head on your pillow at night and sleep? Yeah. And um, I'm hoping that as we talk more and as we help governments, whether it's in legislation against domestic violence or the impact investing that you're talking about or the education of orphans, we should be creating a place that works better, that is more productive and is more attractive for our partners to come because we can't do it all by ourselves. All right. Listening to you all, I keep feeling like it comes back, James, to leadership, a key point that you've made. 
um, to expectations, which I think is such an important point that you made. Changing expectations is so much more complicated than everything else we've talked about because it involves so many aspects. Um, and it's about, it, it, it's providing that access to opportunity that education can do. Um, and ultimately, ultimately, it's about expanding participation in the economy so that everyone can play a productive role. I'm going to close with a question um, that brings us back to mentorship, something that has come up. I mean, the, the, you and Strive are all about mentorship, um, but Tony has made that commitment. Each one of you has, in fact, made that commitment to mentorship. You've also made a commitment to the notion of an African philanthropy forum. And there are really two of the things that the African Philanthropy Forum can be about is one, modeling leadership, mm. uh, philanthropic leadership, but two, committing to mentorship of the next generation mm. of philanthropists that are coming along. And they're coming along, right? There is this next generation. This is a young panel, but there are even younger ones coming up. Um, so if, if, I think I'm going to turn to you, Ebe, on this and say, what would be your ultimate goal as you look at an opportunity to build, to build a, a community of African philanthropists? What's the, out, the, the, the big outcome you're looking for? The big outcome? Um, I think it's actually to address the issue that Mrs. Soraki mentioned, um, that in the process of creating this wealth, that the wealth is actually also um, having that social impact, creating jobs, creating opportunities, um, and, and creating a system that's not so divided. Um, there's 150 private jets in Nigeria, and there's only about four registered philanthropies. That's a problem. If we could get 150 um, you know, of the, the guys who own the jets to have 150 philanthropies, each one of them pursuing a passion that they have to make lives better for the poor, I think we could have a fantastic transformation in that country. So please, please, first, I, I, I just want to acknowledge that a member of our advisory board, Angelique Kaju, is in the audience here with us. Uh, and uh, originally from Benin, but really a neighbor of Nigeria, and um, uh, right next door. And she's also uh, been a strong advocate of the African Philanthropy Forum and will join us in guiding us. And she's infected the closing panel tomorrow. But until then, or until our next panel, which is momentarily, I really want to ask you to join me in applauding these remarkable individuals. <laughs>